Turn with me in your Bibles to the epistle of 1st John. 1st John chapter 1. For those of you who were not with us during the last hour, in our adult class, we are doing a study of the epistle of First John. In our first study, we looked at the historical background of this epistle, and we learned that John was writing to this church in response to heresies which had been propagated among them by former members of their own assembly. And John, by inspiration of the Spirit, tells his readers that these former members were not Christians at all. In fact, in chapter 2, he calls them antichrist, those who are against Christ or those who are the opposite of Christ. But by this time, they had led the church astray by their teaching. They had now departed and the church was left in a spiritual mess. Now, as we examined several portions of this letter, we determined that these antichrists had been teaching the basic doctrines of a heresy which later came to be known as Gnosticism. And in Gnosticism, salvation came through knowledge. The ultimate pursuit of the Gnostic was the attainment of knowledge. And since such saving knowledge was only the possession of the elite Gnostic, those who thought they had this knowledge became very prideful. Therefore, it became a very exclusivistic religion. A second major tenet of Gnosticism was their dualistic philosophy, which led them to believe that everything which was spiritual was good, but everything which was physical or material was evil. So from the Gnostic perspective, the material world was in and of itself evil. Thus, by definition, it could not have been created by the good God, therefore it must have been created by a lesser evil God. Also from the Gnostic perspective, the incarnation of Christ was impossible because a good divine Christ would have no contact with an evil body. Also from the Gnostic perspective, any bodily resurrection was repulsive. Since their goal was to rid themselves of this evil body, having it raised from the dead was out of the question. And finally, from the Gnostic perspective, sin was an activity only of man's inherently evil body. In their thinking, the inherently good spirit of man could not sin. And since sin could not contaminate man's good spirit, and the evil body was already contaminated, then there was no reason to refrain from sinning. Now, these were the basic doctrines which had been propagated among John's readers. And they had caused much, much spiritual damage. And John writes this letter not only to refute these heresies, but also to restore to his readers the joy of their salvation. Now, with that historical background, John begins his letter by addressing the subject of the incarnation of Christ. And in the first four verses of chapter 1, John declares to his readers that Jesus Christ is the eternal God who took upon himself human flesh. He tells them that the one who had been with the Father from the beginning had been manifested unto the apostles in a physical body, a physical body which they had heard with their ears, which they had seen with their eyes, and which they had handled and touched with their hands. Contrary to the teachings of these Gnostic antichrists whose theology would not tolerate the truth of the Incarnation, John, as the spokesman for his fellow apostles, declares that Jesus Christ is indeed both God and man. Then beginning in verse 5, John begins to address the, the claim of these former members that they were in fellowship with God. And he addresses that issue by explaining what true fellowship with God really involves. And he tells his readers that the first thing true fellowship with God involves is moral conformity or moral likeness to the nature of God. Since God is light, says John, one who has true fellowship with God must walk in the light. 
And if one walks in darkness, his profession of having fellowship with God is a lie. Of course, the word light is used here as a figure of speech. And we learned that it was an echo of Jesus' earlier figurative use of this same word. And we learned that it was used by John to communicate that God is truth. So the first thing John says in addressing the Gnostic claim of having fellowship with God is that one who has true fellowship with God is characterized by a lifestyle of habitual conformity to God's revealed truth. That one who has true fellowship with God is characterized by a lifestyle of living according to the Word of God. Now with that review behind us, and with you who are visitors among us and you who are in other classes now apprised of where we have been, During this hour, we will be looking at the second thing John says in explaining what true fellowship with God really is. And beginning in verse 8 of 1 John chapter 1, the apostle addresses the subject of true fellowship with God and the issue of sin. True fellowship with God and the issue of sin. And we will look at this portion beginning in verse 8 of chapter 1 and going through verse 2 of chapter 2 under the following two headings. First of all, sin must be confessed. And then secondly, sin must be dealt with. But before we get into our study, let's again ask for God's help. Our Father, we come this morning thanking you for your mercies to us, thanking you for your promise never to leave us nor forsake us. We come asking for your presence among us, that you would come by your Spirit and help us, that you would cause us in dullness of mind and tiredness of body to indeed worship you as we ought, help us to understand your word. Help us, our Father, to understand what you are saying through your apostle to your people of old. But then, our Father, help us to understand how that applies to us as well. Our Father, we come this morning with a sense of our felt weakness. We thank you for your promise that you use the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. So we ask that you would come and bless us. That you would help us. That you would use us this day for your glory. For the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In verses 5 through 7 of 1 John chapter 1, John has just addressed these false teachers' profession of being in fellowship with God. And he's made it very clear that their claims to be in fellowship with God while living in a way which is contrary to the revealed truth of God, that those claims are lies. He says in verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with Him, that is, with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So by inspiration of the Spirit of God, John has made it clear that a lifestyle of habitual sinning and a profession of fellowship with God are absolutely incompatible. Now, beginning in verse 8, John addresses the thinking of these false teachers on the issue of sin. In verses 5 through 7, he made it clear that these antichrists, these former members of the church, these false teachers, had sinful lifestyles. But, of course, they had a response to that. They had an explanation for their sinning. And beginning in verse 8, John addresses their explanation for their own sin. Notice what he says beginning in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar And his word is not in us. Now remember from our study 
of the historical background of these letters, of this letter, that these early Gnostics believed that sin was the activity of man's inherently evil body, the activity of man's flesh. Since by their definition everything physical was evil and everything spiritual was good, then sin, which in itself is evil, must be something that man's, quote, evil body does and must be something which has no contact with man's, quote, good spirit. Since the real person in their thinking was the inherently good spirit of man, and that spiritual part of man cannot be contaminated by the sins of their evil bodies, then why refrain from sin? Since sin does not touch the spirit and the body is already evil, then why refrain from sinning? And with that philosophy, they could honestly say, I do not sin. They could say with a straight face, the real me does not sin. To which John responds in verse 8. If we say, and here he is echoing the position of these false teachers... If we say that we have no sin, and here's his response. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we are self-deceived, says the apostle, and the truth is not in us. Now, in this verse, the word sin is singular. And most of the commentators agree that this is not a reference to to specific acts of sin, but rather a reference to to the propensity or the inclination in man to sin. Curtis Vaughn says this, that it is a reference to the inward principle of sin as distinguished from the manifestation of this principle that is sinful acts. So the claim of these Gnostic false teachers is that they have no sinful nature. The claim is that they have no dispositional bias to sin. And of course, what they meant was that their good spirit, the real person, has no natural inclination to sin because the spirit of man is good by their definition. Now notice John does not mince any words in his response to this heresy. He does not mince any words at all. It is critical that his readers understand that this is a damning heresy. So it's critical, it's critical to him that they understand that this heresy will damn them. So John does not tactfully say, well, maybe from their perspective they have a point. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, we certainly don't want to offend anyone, so why don't we discuss this and see if we can find some common ground. No, by inspiration of the Spirit of truth, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This word deceive is the same word, the same Greek word that the apostle uses in verse 26 of chapter 2. Turn over there just a moment. Notice how the word is used in verse 26 of chapter 2, the exact same Greek word. 1 John 2:26 These things have I written unto you concerning them that would lead you astray. This word means to lead astray. These false teachers who had been leading astray John's readers with their faulty view of sin, they had also been leading themselves astray. That's what he's saying back in chapter 1. John says in chapter 2, they've been leading you astray. But in chapter 1, when he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, there he's saying they've not only been leading you astray, they've been leading themselves astray. Not only that, says John, but also their denial of their sinful nature is evidence that the truth is not in them. That the truth is not in them. And that is so because God's revealed truth teaches that sin is in the inner man, not in the flesh. 
Jesus says, out of the heart comes forth evil. So John's response to this denial of man's sinful nature, this denial by these false teachers and any denial by those who might have been following them, John's response is, if we say we have no sin, if we say we have no natural disposition, no natural inclination to sin, we lead ourselves astray. And the truth is not in us. Now remember, these Gnostics were proud of their knowledge of truth. That was their main goal in life, to attain knowledge and to attain truth. They were proud of their knowledge of truth. So here John cuts them down to size. He hits them where they live. And he does that by saying to them, any who might be tempted to follow them, they don't know the truth at all. In fact, they are so ignorant, so ignorant of truth that they're even leading themselves astray. You see, he's taking a dig at their desire for greater knowledge. And of course, that's one of the things that's causing John's readers to want to follow them. That we can gain this greater knowledge and John says they don't have knowledge. They're leading themselves astray by this idea that they have no sinful disposition. Not only are they leading themselves astray, but they're evidencing that they really, in spite of their claims, have no truth. Now, for just a moment, skip down with me to verse 10. And notice that John addresses another aspect of their heresy with respect to sin. 1 John 1 and verse 10. John says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, that is God, a liar, and his word is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Again, John is echoing the teaching of these Gnostic antichrists. Not only did they deny that the real person had any natural disposition to sin, in verse 8. But here John echoes their claim that they've never committed any acts of sin either. If we say that we have not sinned, and that was their contention. That is what they were saying. The real me, the immaterial part of me, has never committed one act of sin. Those sins that I've committed are simply the acts of my outward evil flesh. My spirit is sinless. You see how pious that sounds? To which John responds, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. If we say that we have never committed a single sinful act, we make God a liar because God says for all have sinned. And in addition to that, John says, if we say we have not sinned, we show evidence that God's word has not taken root in us. And the message to John's readers was that if you insist upon following these false teachers, if you buy into their heretical views of sin, if you swallow this idea that you have no sinful disposition, if you swallow this idea that you have never sinned, if you swallow this idea that sin is not a problem for you, if you embrace that, you are also leading yourself astray and you are also proving that God's truth, God's word has not taken root in you. And in addition to that, you are calling God a liar. This is a critical issue to John. A critical issue for the eternal souls of his readers are at stake. And John is not playing here. He's not playing here. These are not word games. At this point, he's grabbing his readers by their lapels and trying to shake some sense into them. Do you have any idea what you're doing by flirting with this heresy? He's saying to them, you're putting yourself in opposition to God. You're saying, I believe one thing, God says something else, he's the liar. Do you see what you're doing, he's saying to them, by flirting with this heresy? You're putting yourself in opposition to God. No matter what your teachers tell you, God says you are a sinner. 
But then in the midst of exposing this heresy, which denies that sin is a problem, in verse 9, John tells his readers that it is a problem. And he tells them what part of the solution to that problem is. Notice verse 9 of chapter 1, sandwiched between verse 8 and verse 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice how John again refutes this heretical view of sin. These false teachers were teaching that sin was not an issue to be concerned about. That's what they were teaching. Sin is simply the activity of the outward evil flesh. Since it's the good spirit that goes to be with God, God's not concerned with what your outward evil flesh does. Therefore, sin is not a problem. In verses 8 and 10, John explicitly, he directly refutes that heresy. But here in verse 9, he indirectly refutes that heresy by implying that sin is a problem because it is something that needs God's forgiveness. He's implying in his words of verse 9 that sin is indeed a problem. Contrary to what your teachers have told you, sin is indeed a problem because it requires, it needs God's forgiveness. That suggests that this sin which the Gnostics taught was of no consequence was in fact offensive to God, thus the need for forgiveness. And as a means toward that forgiveness, John says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Now, this word which is translated confess is the Greek word homologeo. It's a compound word made up of two Greek words, one being homoios, which means like or similar, and the other word lego, which means to speak. And when you put these two words together and you come up with the word homologeo, it means to speak like or to speak similarly, to speak the same thing or to agree with. That's what the word means. Now, remember the context. Remember the context in which this word is used. These false teachers were not in agreement with God on the issue of sin. They were not in agreement with God on the issue of sin. They said they had no sinful nature. God said they did. They said that they had not committed acts of sin, but God said they had. Now, John, in that context, says their view of sin is wrong. Sin is a problem. Sin does need God's forgiveness. Sin does need God's cleansing. And one means toward that forgiveness, one means toward that cleansing, says John, is the confession of our sin. So by confession, John does not mean simply saying with our lips, God, I have sinned. That's not what confession means. That's not what he means by that. What he is saying is that one means toward the initial and ongoing forgiveness and cleansing of our sin is to do just the opposite of what these false teachers were doing. One means toward the forgiveness of our sins initially and the ongoing forgiveness of our sins. And the cleansing of our sins was to do just the opposite of what these Gnostic Antichrists were doing. They disagreed with God about their sinful disposition. They disagreed with God about having committed acts of sin. To them, sin was no problem. And of course, that meant that it needed no solution. And if there's no problem with sin, then there's no need of a Savior. You see how critical this issue was. But John reminds them that sin is a problem. And the solution to that problem, the forgiveness of our sin and the cleansing of our sin comes only if we confess, that is, we agree with God concerning our sin. 
He's telling them you've got to do just the opposite of what your teachers are telling you to do. They're telling you, they're teaching you to disagree with God concerning your sin. John says one thing that leads toward forgiveness and toward the cleansing of sin is our agreeing with God concerning our sin. His word says that we have a sinful disposition. In God's word, God says we have committed many acts of sin. And here by inspiration of the Spirit of God, John says, forgiveness of that sin and cleansing of that sin will come only if we agree with God on the issue of our sinful condition. Do you see how John is still trying to get their attention? Apparently some of them were tempted to follow these false teachers. Sin is no problem. It's only the flesh that sins. This good God is not concerned about our evil flesh. It's your spirit that's going to be with God, so don't worry about a few fleshly sins. Sin's no problem. To which John responds, they are self-deceived. They are leading themselves astray. They are ignorant of the truth. And in saying that, they are calling God a liar. The real you does continue to sin. And that sin, says John, is a problem. It makes you culpable in God's sight. Therefore, you need God's forgiveness. It makes you filthy in God's sight. Therefore, you need God's cleansing. And those things are only possible, says John, if you confess your sin, if you agree with God's assessment of your sin. John says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Clearly, clearly true fellowship with God must be accompanied by our agreement with God on the issue of sin. How can we have true fellowship with God if we disagree on such a major issue? True fellowship with God must be accompanied by our agreement with God on the issue of sin. Because otherwise, otherwise, if we are of, different, uh, of a different opinion than God, then God's truth is not in us. And if we are of a different opinion than God, then we are in the posture of calling God a liar. But then that's not all John says about fellowship with God and the issue of sin. In addition to the fact that sin must be confessed, in the first two verses of chapter 2, John tells us that sin must be dealt with. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. My little children... These things I write unto you that you may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Notice, the God we serve is not like the Gnostics. He's not exclusivistic. He's not interested in just saving us, but he saves men from all over the world. So John begins this section, notice, by making sure that his readers do not misunderstand and do not misapply what he has said in chapter 1. In verse 8, John has suggested that Christians still sin, including himself by using the first person plural pronoun, we, John says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, taking the wrong conclusion, his readers might reason if all Christians, even the great apostle, still sin. Then real victory over sin in this life is impossible. So what's the point of struggling against sin if I'm never going to rid myself of it? I might as well go ahead and sin. Also in verse 9, when he speaks of God's forgiveness, 
and God's cleansing of sin, the only thing he mentions on man's part is the confession of sin. A wrong conclusion there might reason, well, if all I have to do to have God's forgiveness and to have God's cleansing is to acknowledge that I've done something wrong, that's easy enough. I'll just go ahead and sin and then take care of it by a few words of confession. And we all know a lot of folks that follow that same principle, don't we? So both of those verses, verses 8 and verse 9, if misunderstood, could promote a laxity in his reader's ongoing struggle against their remaining sins. So to try to head off any such misunderstanding, to try to head off any such misapplication of what he has already said, John begins verse 1 of chapter 2 by saying, My little children, these things I write unto you that you may not sin. I'm writing to you, he says, to, not to give you an excuse to sin. My goal in writing is that you may not sin. But then, being a realist and knowing that his readers would yet sin more, in the middle of verse 1, John adds this. But, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, in this portion, John again suggests that sin is an ongoing problem for the child of God. You see, he's still still taking shots at these false teachers, not just for the sake of taking shots, but he's addressing these things for the purpose of, of protecting his readers from their heresy. So here again, here again, he suggests that sin is an ongoing problem for the child of God. Contrary to what these antichrists had taught them, sin is an ongoing problem with the child of God. That is suggested by the fact that the sinner needs an advocate. If sin was not a problem, why do you need an advocate? It's also suggested by the fact that That propitiation for sin is needed. So John is continuing to refute these false teachings on the issue of sin. But in doing so, he tells his readers what the solution to their problem with sin is. While assuring them that they do have a problem with sin. In the midst of that, he tells them what the solution to their problem with sin is. Since sin is not a non-issue, and since unlike the ignorant Gnostics, sin cannot be ignored, then what's the solution? If we can't ignore it like the Gnostics and hope that it will go away and that we'll never hear from it again, then that means we have a problem with it. What is the solution to that problem? John says the solution is, if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now, this word advocate comes from the Greek word parakletos. Another compound word. Para means beside or alongside of. And kletos means one who has been called. So you combine those two words together. It means one has been, who has been called alongside of someone else. That's what a parakletos is. One who has been called alongside of another person. Now the purpose for which this word, uh, or the purpose for which the parakletos has been called alongside the other person, that is not inherent in the word itself, but must be determined from the context in which the word is used. In John chapter 14, For instance, in verse 16, this word parakletos is used of the Holy Spirit. And the context of that passage suggests that the Spirit is called alongside of the child of God for the purpose of comforting the child of God. Jesus says, I'm going back to the Father. I will send you a parakletos. I will not leave you desolate. I will send you a parakletos. So in John 14, the word is translated by our English word comforter because the context suggests that the Spirit is called alongside of the child of God for the purpose of comforting him. Now in our passage, verse 1 
of 1 John chapter 2, what is the context in which this word is used here? The context is the courtroom of God the Father. That's the context. The courtroom of God the Father. A courtroom in which the Christian finds himself as a result of the sin which contrary to these false teachers the Christian actually committed and for which the Christian is actually responsible. Now in that context, Jesus is the parakletos of his people. He is the one who is called alongside his people to stand with them and to represent them before the judgment bar of his Father. And because that is the context, this word is translated in most of our English translations as advocate. Jesus is like a lawyer representing his people in the courtroom of the judge of the universe. So the solution for the problem of sin in the life of the child of God, the solution is not that we ignore it like the Gnostics, not that we deny that it exists, but the solution is that we do not have to stand at the judgment bar of God alone. That's the solution. The solution is that we as the children of God do not have to stand at the judgment bar of God alone, but we have Jesus Christ to stand beside us and to represent us. But John doesn't stop there. John doesn't stop there to make sure that his readers understand what having Jesus as our advocate really means. John adds two things which show his peculiar qualifications for the job of representing his people in the courtroom of God the Father. And the first of these qualifications is found at the end of verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, or literally, Jesus Christ the righteous one. So the one who is our representative in the courtroom of the Father is righteous. He has no sin of his own for which to answer. He is our sinless high priest. He is our sinless representative. And that's no small thing. That's no small thing. In the old covenant, when the priest went into the holy of holies, he was Israel's representative in the place of God's special presence. And before that high priest could offer up sacrifices for the sins of Israel, he had to offer up sacrifices for his own sins. Before he could be an acceptable representative for Israel, the high priest had to be cleansed of his own sins. And in our passage, John reminds his readers that their representative before God the Father is qualified to be their advocate, is qualified to be their representative because he is already without sin. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But not only that, in verse 2, John reminds his readers of a second peculiar qualification which Jesus has to be the representative of his people in the courtroom of God the Father. Notice what he says in the last part of verse 1 and the first part of verse 2. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, first of all, the righteous one, and he is the propitiation for our sins. He's not only the righteous one, but he is also the propitiation for our sins. The second thing which qualifies Jesus to be the one to represent his people is that he is the propitiation for our sins. Now what does that mean? What is meant when John says he is the propitiation for our sins? Well, the word propitiate means to appease an offended person. That's what to propitiate means. To appease an offended person. And in this case, the offended person is God. He is a being of infinite holiness. And because of his nature, he cannot tolerate sin. His natural response to sin is anger. 
his natural response, that is his response growing out of his holy nature, is that of anger and wrath. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, For the wrath or the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What's God's response to the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men? The wrath or the anger of God. In Ephesians 5, because of these things, says Paul, the things listed in earlier verses, the sins listed in earlier verses, because of these things comes the wrath or the anger of God upon the sons of disobedience. So what is God's response to these sins that are listed in Ephesians 5? His anger and His wrath against the sons of disobedience. So because of God's infinite holiness, His natural reaction is to be offended by our sin. And because of His infinite justice, His natural reaction is that He must judge our sin. He must judge our sin. And since we are all sinners, that's been established already, even though the Gnostics didn't believe it. John's readers were about to be led astray by it. It was established that we are all sinners. And since we are all sinners, the only hope for any of us is that our offended God be appeased. That's our only hope. Because by His very nature, He must be angry at our sin. And because He's a just God, He must judge our sin. There's no way around it. To be God, He must do that. So the only hope we have as sinners is that our God be appeased. Now under the old covenant, that was done on the day of atonement. When the high priest took the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, into the special presence of God, and sprinkled that blood upon the mercy seat. With that, Israel's offended God was temporarily appeased. In fact, so much was the offering of sacrifices for the purpose of appeasing the offended Jehovah that in Hebrews 9, in verse 5, where the different pieces of temple furniture are listed, the place upon which the sacrificial blood was sprinkled is called the propitiatory. The exact same Greek word that's applied to Jesus in our passage, hilosmos. Same word. So when John says, Jesus is the propitiation, he is the halosmos of our sins, he is saying that the one who appeases the God whom has been offended by our sins is Jesus. The one who appeases our offended God, the one who appeases the offended God for his people is Jesus. He is somewhat like the high priest of the old covenant but the difference is that Jesus is not only our high priest who sprinkles the sacrificial blood upon the propitiatory Jesus is also the sacrifice and Jesus is not only one who brings the offended father that which appeases him Jesus is himself that which appeases him And Jesus not only works around the propitiatory, he is himself the propitiation. He's not just a high priest with the sacrifice. Jesus is the high priest and the sacrifice. As John stated it, he is the righteous one and the propitiation for our sins. So what makes him qualified to represent us before the Father? What makes him qualified to come along beside us and be our advocate in the courtroom of the God of the universe? It is because he is both the righteous high priest and the appeasing sacrifice. So what is the solution to the problem of sin? Well, clearly it is not to deny that we have sinned. Because according to John, by inspiration of the Spirit, those who deny their sinfulness are self-deceived. That is, they lead themselves astray. 
Those who deny their sinfulness are evidencing the fact that God's truth has not taken root in them. And worse than that, those who deny their sinfulness are calling God a liar. So the solution to the problem of our sin is certainly not to deny that we are sinners. The solution, says John, is to confess our sin. That is, to agree with God's assessment of our sin. And secondly, to take that sin to the Lord Jesus. He has all the qualifications necessary to represent us before his offended father. He is permitted into the presence of his father because of his righteousness. He's permitted into the presence of his father like the Old Testament was permitted into the Holy of Holies because of his sinfulness or his sinlessness. And he is able to appease his father not only because he is the high priest, but also because he is our sacrifice. So when the Son of God entered into the presence of the Father to make propitiation with the blood of the sacrifice, it was his own blood that appeased our offended God. And as he represents us before the Father, he will not seek to appease the Father by convincing him that we are innocent. He will not be like the false teachers who ignorantly claimed they have nothing to be judged for. We are innocent. So he will not seek to appease the Father by convincing him that we are ignorant. The Father knows better than that. Our advocate will appease his Holy Father by representing us as guilty sinners. But sinners whose penalty has already been paid by his own sacrifice on the cross. And in that day, God can be both just and And the justifier of those who are in Christ Jesus. Because his holy wrath has already been poured out against our sins in the person of our substitute. Our judgment has been poured out upon his son. And therefore he can justly pronounce us to be forgiven sinners. So you see true fellowship with God does not come in the denial of our sin. True fellowship with God comes in confessing our sin and dealing with our sin through the Lord Jesus. And for you who are strangers to our Savior here in our midst this morning, let me remind you that you also have sinned against this holy God. Everyone in this room has sinned against the God that we've been speaking about. And according to his own testimony, he is offended by your sin. Your sin has made him angry. And his wrath is towards you. And the day will come when you will stand in his presence You will stand in the courtroom of this offended God. We're told it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. After death, there you are in the courtroom of God. In the courtroom of our offended God. And you will know that you are guilty. You may deny it now. But on that day, you will know that you are guilty. And he will know you are guilty too. But unlike the child of God, you will be standing there alone. Unlike the child of God, you will be standing there alone in the presence of an offended, angry God with no advocate, no representative, no propitiation, no one to appease his wrath. And what hope do you think you'll have of escaping the just sentence Of being cast into the lake of fire forever. What hope do you think you will have? According to the testimony of the judge himself. You will then have no hope. But for you that day has not yet come, has it? 
That day has not yet come. And as long as you are in the land of the living, there is still hope. But the only hope, the only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your hope is only in one who sacrificed himself on the cross for sinners. That sinners might be forgiven. That sinners might be delivered from the wrath to come. That wrath of an angry God that will surely come. So I plead with you. I plead with you. Don't ignore what I'm telling you. You children. Don't ignore what I'm telling you. Because the day will come. When you will learn that what I'm saying to you is absolutely true. So I plead with you to turn from your sin. Agree with God about your, His assessment of your sinful condition. And then turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. He has promised that he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this, your word, through your servant, John. We thank you, our Father, that you have not left us in darkness, but that you have indeed revealed truth to us. Our Father, we who are your people are thankful for this truth concerning your Son, that you have sent him to die that you have sent him to be the sacrifice for the sins of his people, that he is our advocate, that he is our representative in your presence, and that he is well qualified for that, for he is sinless, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And our Father, we are thankful that even though we have remaining sin, that we have one standing in your presence, who pleads our case for us. We come, our Father, confessing our sin. We come agreeing with you that your assessment of our sin is accurate, that we have rebelled against you. So we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would forgive us our sin. But our Father, we think also of those among us this morning who have no advocate with you, those who are strangers to your grace, those who are strangers to the Lord Jesus. We ask, our Father, that you would cause them to see the seriousness of their condition. Cause them, our Father, to see that the only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died that sinners might be delivered from the wrath to come. Be merciful unto them. By your Spirit, open their eyes. We plead especially for our children. That you would open their eyes that they might see. That they might turn from their sin. And that they might cling to Christ. We thank you again for this time around your word. Now burn it into our hearts. And use it for your glory. In Jesus name. Amen.